Hello and good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you sitting there in, in person, my apology to you for not showing up there. I've come down with a cold and a, uh, and a uh, cough, so I didn't want you to feel uncomfortable I being in that room. But uh, thanks for coming. My name is Deepak Mishra. I'm the director and chief executive of ICREA. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the launch of the study, Hidden Potential Rethinking Informality in South Asia. It's a World Bank report prepared by Mauricio Busolo and Siddharth Sharma. We are delighted that both of, our, both of the, Mauricio and Siddharth are there on the stage. Uh, and we have a fabulous uh, set of panelists to talk about the India specific. So after the launch of the report, we'll get into the informality in India. And that session will be led by uh, Mr. Anil Bharadwaj, the Secretary General for Federation of Indian MSMEs. And we have uh, four fabulous speakers with uh, deep knowledge and understanding of the issue. We'll have Dr. Pranav Sen, Dr. Radhika Kapoor, Dr. Shomri Kanthi Ghosh, and, uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Bhatnagar from the World Bank. So it's a real pleasure to have you all in this room. I'll take two minutes just to set the context as to why we're interested in partnering with the World Bank to launch this report. And uh, basically three things that were our motivation. And the first is a pretty obvious thing that informality is a major development challenge in India, not just in South Asia. And an issue where a research is limited and our understanding is inadequate. So we felt that this is a good opportunity to have an informed and insightful discussion using the report um, as the chapeau to think about the India specific issue. The second is the debate in on informality, and as Mauricio presentation will show, has been very dispersed and polarized. You know, some people think informality is a is a sign of underdevelopment, and this is a sector that should be discouraged. So the you know, as India becomes more wealthy and prosperous, the informality should shrink. And other people think a robust informal sector is actually a sign of inclusive development. So this is a sector that should actually be supported during transition period. And this report takes a middle path uh, and tries to respect the two sides of the views, but finds a way out. So I thought this would be an interesting context around which we can set our debate. And the third point uh, is a bit of a self-promotion is that in, in a career, we have actually made informality and MSMA a fairly important part per, of our work program. We are working with the Ministry of Commerce as a knowledge partner for the G20 work, where we are preparing a position paper on integrating MSMEs to global trade. Uh, we prepare annual survey of MSMEs uh, uh, and how they are integrating with the digital commerce and e-commerce. The first report was launched in February 2022, and the next one will be done out in 2023. And so we feel our work program is expanding, and this was a good opportunity to, to bring together some of the important people who are thinking of these issues and have a very informed and insightful discussion. So with that, uh, a big thank you to everybody who has uh, organized this event. I should also thank... Uh, both Dr. Radhika Kapoor and Tanu Goel, uh, Dr. Tanu Goel, who are the ones who are leading this work from a career side to be there and for Radhika to be in the panel. So with that, let me then in, in, invite uh, uh, the World Bank team, Mauricio and Siddharth, to start the presentation. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Deepak, for your um, intro remarks. Um, I hope you, you feel better, uh, better soon. Uh, thank you, Ikria, and everybody to organize this. Uh, we are very, very glad to be uh, launching this, uh, this study. We have been working on this for, for uh, quite some time. And, um, and so glad, glad to uh, put it out uh, uh, today. Okay, so I'll, um, my name is Maurizio Busono. I work at the Chief Economist Office at, uh, of uh, South Asia at the, at the World Bank. And I will introduce uh, uh, this, this report. And uh, uh, Siddharth will, will take over in about, in about 10 minutes. Okay, so... <clears throat> uh, as uh, Deepak was, was saying, uh, informality is a major uh, development issue in, in South Asia. Uh, it's, it has remained uh, uh, wide, widespread. Uh, you have uh, uh, 
uh, about um, three quarters of, uh, or even more than three quarters of the labor force in non-farm, that is uh, uh, in, in the informal, in the informal uh, segment of the economy. And if you look at the uh, informal farms, the share is even, is even higher. And it's higher than in most of the other regions, as you can see from, from, from this graph. And in some sense, is even even increased more recently. So um, it's it's persistent uh, even after decades of, of strong growth. There are a few theory of development that would say that the growth it should it should disappear, but it's it's still there, and and it's it's concerned for three major reasons. The first is that <clears throat> uh, informality tends to be associated to uh, low earnings, uh, low productivity. Uh, it tends to be also associated with uh, uh, vulnerability. The condition of work are not very good, uh, and um, in um, and also there's uh, uh, an issue of of government revenue. So it is associated with low growth, uh, poverty inequality, and uh, uh, potentially a, a low a low a low uh, revenue. So. However, uh, it's important that not to, and, and that's, that comes in our title, uh, hidden potential, it's important not to uh, think of informality as the causes of these, of these issues, as causality can go also uh, on the other way. And in fact, the debate is vast. Uh, there's, a, there's a huge literature on, on informality. But when you look closely, it, it basically is polarizing to two camps. Uh, the first uh, uh, camp is that um, basically uh, informal either uh, workers or firm tend to avoid uh, taxation. They are uh, trying to evade the regulation because of some intrinsic uh, uh, low level of their own productivity or, or capacity or skills. And so they cannot be competitive, so they choose to be to be outside of the, of, of the formal segment. Uh, the opposing view to this is, is an exclusion view. Is that, in fact, the informal um, people and firm operate in a, a distorted environment and they cannot uh, access uh, uh, the formal sector. The formal sector erects barriers, there are entry barriers, and all the, fa the fact on the euro barriers and so uh, and so this is this is the diagnosis for the exclusion interestingly these two views have a very very different uh, uh, policy uh, recommendation the first one the choice the policy recommendation that derives from that is well uh, the problem is intrinsic in the in the informality so we need to cure informality and we need to cure it by investing more, increasing their capacity, or if it's if it's um, uh, really escaping regulation, uh, enforcing more more rigidly, more more effectively. Uh, and this is opposite to the um, policy recommendation that comes from the exclusion view, which is well, it's uh, the regulations that are a problem, the barriers that are a problem, the lack of competition. And so we need to remedy that to, to uh, reduce, reduce informality and the, the potential consequences of that. So these two views have clear policy implications. And, and so they are, they are convincing a lot of people because they, 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 they seem uh, clear what what to do about that, but in fact, uh, it's uh, again by looking at the vast literature, we we are not satisfied by by these two views, and um, and and a lot of the a lot of the policy that follows these two views have not been very effective uh, because they miss uh, some key aspects uh, uh, that uh, uh, we reflect on. First of all, that. <clears throat> And we emphasize a lot of this in the in the various uh, parts of the report uh, of the studies. First of all, that uh, informality is, uh, is is really heterogeneous. It's uh, and I'll, I'll I'll elaborate a bit more about that. Uh, then that um, 
the two uh, informality and formality coexist. So there are there are connections uh, whereby these two sectors continue to coexist for for a very long time. Uh, there's there's uh, um, in um, in, an, in another study that we did uh, before this, we examined how many uh, formal informal workers are employed by formal firms. So formal firms employ a lot of informal workers in the, in, in uh, I, I guess the statistics go from uh, slightly below 10% in, in India to up to 20% uh, in, in, in Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and other, and other, and other countries. So, so uh, there's, there's these this linkages, complex linkages that we need to take into account. So when, when we, we, we want to have a more effective policy and then, <clears throat> and then also the, uh, the whole uh, changing the competition policy or changing the enforcement requires deep institutional change. So there is also political economy that is behind uh, the the issue of reducing reducing informality. So what what we suggest is that we need to rethink uh, uh, and 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 we propose a rethinking uh, of informality that reconcile a little bit these two opposite views. And uh, basically entails the, the recognition of, of um, the fact that, um, yes, there are some firms that avoid uh, regulation, but it's also true that there, are, there is a serious misallocation of, of resources. And if we, if we don't look at what happens in the formal sector, we can't really resolve, resolve uh, the, the issue of informality. Um, there are some uh, new ways of, of, of looking at informality, uh, which, or, or, or better, uh, uh, interesting, promising uh, avenues to reduce informality. One that uh, we look uh, uh, in, this, in this volume uh, is that offered by uh, the digital economy. And uh, um, uh, it, it is promising, it changes, it shifts the benefits of becoming visible, but it's, it works, it's not a silver bullet. It works for some parts of the uh, informality, but not, not for all. Uh, and um, a, last, a last important part of our thinking is how to protect the vulnerability. How can you, uh, can a country extend uh, the protection uh, and, or from, enlarging the current system of formal uh, towards more informal or uh, from the bottom, uh, improving the social assistance and trying to cover the, uh, the middle of, of informality. So those are, those are some of the avenues that we think are crucial to, to rethink uh, informality. Um, uh, this is a collective work. I just flash here. Uh, the the title of uh, of uh, the, the chapters that are in the studies that are in this in this volume is a three hundred and so pages. But uh, I invite all of you to 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 uh, pick and choose what you want to look at. Broadly, it's divided in three parts. One is this uh, determinants of informality. Then these uh, complete this harnessing of uh, the digital technology and other other intervention that may shift uh, the, the possibility of reducing informality. And the third one is, is more about uh, the vulnerability and how to, uh, how to cover uh, that. We don't have time to go on to all of these studies that are, uh, but, but in, in, in the volume they are, they are all there. Um, so before um, giving the floor to Siddharth, let me uh, quickly go through the, the main messages and the conceptual uh, framework equity. And then I pass the floor to, to Sudar to get, get you more details. Okay, so uh, if uh, uh, informality is heterogeneous, we need to understand uh, what kind of type of informal firms are the most uh, uh, dom dominant in, 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 in these countries. And one first thing that we see clearly is that a lot of informal firms are actually uh, outside the purview of, of regulation because they are small and rather the, the, the reverse that they 
remain small to a scale regulation. So that's that's important. Uh, first uh, empirical message. The second one is that, <clears throat> in part because of that, when we when you focus the reform only on what is the difficulty to 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 register to become from informal to formal, if you simplify just that, uh, the, and there has been a lot of uh, a lot of emphasis in, in a lot of. Uh, uh, countries uh, beyond the South Asia to just simplify that, it doesn't have, a, it doesn't seem to have a big effect. However, if you go deeper and try to change the, the distortions and the entry barrier, the, the fact of entry barrier, then you begin to have uh, a bigger general equilibrium effect. So that's the second message. The third message is that, yes, I already told you so, there is a shift uh, with some new technology. And e-commerce seems to open uh, the door and, and facilitate market access to informal firms, but only a certain category of informal firms, not, not all of them. So you need something in addition to that. It's not a silver bullet. And if you read the, the, a lot of governments, and we went on the website, they even have digital ministers. Now they have a lot of emphasis of expanding the, the digital infrastructure. It's not, it's not a silver bullet. It, 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 it's very important, but it doesn't resolve uh, uh, the, the fully the problem. Um, and finally, and finally, we have uh, some recipe on how to improve uh, improve protection and reduce uh, and reduce uh, the vulnerability by again emphasizing that informal. Uh, Personal, informal, especially person in this case, they don't all have the same uh, saving capacity. Some have zero saving capacity, some have some saving capacity. And so you have to offer them the, the, the correct uh, uh, financial product. Okay, so very quickly, the concept of framework, I'm, I'm almost want to skip this one, but um, let, let's, let, let me give you a, a quick, uh, a quick uh, rundown of this. Um, this basically helps us. Uh, synthesize together these two opposite views. So you have to imagine a, 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 a simple economy where there is no, no government intervention, okay? So it's an imaginary uh, uh, hypothetical economy. And there's a, there's a standard production function for the, for, for the firms that uh, is, they are producing all the homogeneous food, and that's important. Uh, and um, the only main difference is on their total factor productivity, okay? Then when these firms interact in the market, there's the decreasing returns to scale, a, a, a natural size distribution the, the, of, of firms originate, and firms that have a higher uh, um, TFT, total factor productivity, have a higher size. And everything is efficient, and the labor uh, allocation is efficient and uh, the, the output is maximized. Now intervenes the government that puts two, two uh, type of intervention. First, above a certain size uh, queue, firms have to uh, register and uh, have to pay uh, registration and have to pay also a tax on labor, uh, which is to contribute their pension to their uh, social protection. Once you put that threshold, you basically you have uh, you have this situation. Uh, one important uh, uh, point is that there is imperfect uh, um, enforcement of of the registration and taxation on labor, and so uh, the the larger you are, the more visible you are to the enforcer, and so you see this curve. That is the net benefit of formalizing increases with the size, which is on the horizontal axis. You have the size of the firm that is proportional to the DFP, and you have this increasing uh, curve that gives you the net gains of formalizing. So what happens is that firms that are above R, which is needed to pay the entry cost, are all formal, and they comply and they are uh, paying the taxes and the entry registration. And it's they, their return of the informal is above the entry cost and they, they, they make sense for them to formalize. Everything below is informal 
everything below R, but there are two distinct, there are three different types of informal uh, firms. One that is below P that is really outside. So they are, they don't have to comply. And for them to comply is, is, is uh, it doesn't make sense because uh, even if they had no to pay the entry cost, they still earn uh, below, uh, the, they, they still, their benefit is negative. Then above, above um, P, there are two other types of, of firms. Those that are closer to, uh, to, to R tend to decide, well, it's not really, I am almost there, but it's not really convenient for me to be visible because I cannot really compete. So maybe I shrink below a certain level and I avoid uh, the taxation. So those are the avoiders. And there's another group that is uh, just the evaders. They, they just, they just uh, decide even if they should, but they decide not to, not to, to be seen. In this situation, labor uh, uh, allocation is no longer uh, optimal. So that's a very simple, uh, there's a lot of modeling behind it, but it's a very simple way to show you that there are different types of informal firms and different reasons why they are informal. So there are the outsider, the evaders, and the avoiders. And we need to uh, figure out what is what in each economy to have the correct uh, the correct policy action. So, um, Mauricio, um, Say yes. that, yeah, I think we we have over 15 minutes for your presentation, Siddharth. Yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm done. I uh, basically, uh, I am uh, going to pass it to, to him uh, very quickly. There's, I already mentioned the first message, so I don't need to, I can, uh, I don't, uh, they, you see, okay, it's gone, okay. Uh, Okay, so <clears throat> the first message I, I already mentioned, and I can I can pass it to the floor to to Siddharth, is that the most of the of the formal firm are uh, are outsiders. Uh, this shows you that uh, a very simple way. You saw that fee, that uh, that threshold that um, uh, concept of framework that the benefits increase with the size. This shows you. Uh, it's not the, ex the exact same, but it shows you that the larger the firm, the, the larger the firm are, the more they report benefits from the informal. And the benefits are able to get a bank account, able to sell to government, uh, less risk to be fine, uh, better reputation, and so, on, and so on. You have a series of things. Every for every each one being larger is 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 appreciate they appreciate more more the benefit. And finally, this overlap that I mentioned, it's, it's very clearly visible here for firms on the left graph and for people on the, on the right graph. Um, uh, but I don't want to spend more time and, and steal time from, from Sudan. So Sudan, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Siddharth, and I'm a colleague of Maurizio in the Office of the Chief Economist for South Asia and the World Bank. So uh, uh, I will present uh, the, the next three main messages of the report, and I'll try to keep it to 15 minutes. Uh, so the first, uh, the, the second main, so Maurizio just spoke about the first main message, which was that Informality in South Asia is dominated by firms that just happen to be small and they're actually outside the purview of regulations. So the second message is, is related somewhat. So it says that um, reforms of business regulations tend to have small direct impacts on the informal sector, but they can have major indirect impacts if they target major inefficiencies in the broader economy. So, um, so let me try to unpack this message, right? So the first half of this was that reforms to business regulations like licensing tend to have small direct impacts. So, so what is the direct impact? Yeah? So many uh, countries have simplified business entry regulations in the hope that this will, uh, this will cause lots of informal firms to formalize. And, and so that's a direct impact of, of, a, of a reform. And uh, so just to give an example of how popular this kind of reform is, between 2004 and 11, 54 countries introduced some sort of technology to simplify business entry. But the literature on, on like the effect of these reforms is quite sobering. Just to give an example, a randomized trial in, in Sri Lanka 
uh, where they gave um, informal firms information on how to register and even paid the cost of registration. Um, uh, found that uh, the formalization of these firms increased by a, by a small by a small degree. In Mexico, a large scale reform that reduced the number of days to start a business from 30 days to one, again, only increased formalization by 5%. Uh, these studies also find that the firms that do get formalized after these interventions, they don't experience any major transformation in their performance and their profits. Um, that being said, it could be that uh, these reforms are not really targeting other hidden barriers to entry. They're only tar targeting the licensing procedure. And it could also be that these reforms have major indirect effects. So that's the second half of this message, um, which is that if there are reforms to other e broader economic distortions, they could have major indirect or general equilibrium effects on the informal sector. So one of the papers in this uh, volume, uh, it quantifies the magnitudes and impacts of, uh, of uh, two types of distortions on, on, on the informal sector. The first type is, uh, is, is what, they, what we call uh, the de facto entry barriers or hidden entry barriers. So if you go back to the conceptual framework, there was an entry cost, but that's explicit. But there can be hidden costs like um, just uh, it's difficult to get, a, get an electricity connection for a business um, or uh, incumbent firms make it hard for you to get access to suppliers, right? So these are de facto entry barriers. And then the second distortion is some, think of uh, going back to the framework, there was a labor tax on informal firms, but not on informal firms. So that's a kind of distortion because it because effectively the price of, of labor uh, was was different for different firms, and it shouldn't be in an optimal uh, uh, optimal economy. So there can be other things like that, like um, unequal enforcement of, of regulations, financial sector uh, sector uh, constraints. All of them can can lead to distortions in resource allocation. So this paper, what it does is it uses data on on Indian manufacturing to estimate these uh, de facto and en um, entry barriers. And this, this, this overall uh, resource distortion in, in, the, in, in firms in, in, in the formal sector. Then what it does is it takes this, this, this uh, the distortion that it observes in the Indian economy, it takes it to a model of the US economy, which, which, which where informality is only at 8%. Okay? And when you introduce the Indian level of distortion, informality in the US goes up to 54%. And that's halfway up, up to the gap between the US and India in terms of the size of the informal sector. So what this means is that a large part of informality can be explained by these broader distortions. And addressing these distortions could lead to major improvements in productivity in the economy and also have an indirect effect on the informal sector. And this indirect effect is, is, is that once you reduce these, these distortions, you unlock innovation in, in, in productive firms. And this makes it harder for unproductive firms, many of which are informal, to survive. And so this chart here shows that the gains, the estimated gains from addressing all of these distortions uh, in, a, in, a, in a set of economies and India somewhere in the middle. Again, these are all estimations. So, but, so there's a lot of potential here, but there are some practical challenges to, to what can be achieved through this, these big, big, deep reforms. The first one is that there is limited knowledge of what actually drives these hidden entry barriers and distortions. So just to give an example, this paper, which I was just talking about, it, it esti the, its estimate of the de facto entry cost was actually much higher than that implied by by explicit licensing costs. So what else is in there? We don't know. The uh, second point is that uh, uh, any single reform by itself is not enough. It's, it's small. So just to give an example, one of the papers in this volume uh, looks at the impact of the introduction of the, of the VAT in an Indian state. And the idea here is that the, the, the VAT reduces the distortion caused by double taxation along the value chain. Right? If you buy from a formal firm, they've already paid a tax, and again, you have to pay a tax. So. So it was like a tax on, on firms in a, 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 a sorry, a, a, it was a double distortion on firms. And, and it was especially uh, tough on large productive firms because these are the firms that tend to buy from other, other formal firms who are paying the sales tax already. So, so what happens when, when the rat is introduced? It actually does uh, improve productivity in, 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 in the economy, in the formal sector, and it grows the formal sector. That's what this paper estimates. But its its direct uh, impact on informality is quite minuscule, and even its indirect effects through the general equilibrium uh, effects is quite quite small. And the third uh, challenge to this path is that there are of course political economy constraints to achieving meaningful reform. Our third main message is about uh, this alternative pathway, which is 
um, e-commerce platforms and digital platforms, they offer new opportunities to informal firms and workers, but uh, but many of them also need complementary skills and, and credit to really take advantage. So what is this new pathway? So if you think about it, these informal firms, especially the small outsider types, they for them, the costs of accessing markets, transporting their goods, uh, is really prohibitively expensive. A digital platform like an e-commerce e platform can, can offer them this, all this infrastructure for reaching markets at a very low cost. It can also reduce transactions cost related to market search, replication, and verification. And they can also give these firms more information about new technologies, business practices, how to track their, their own performance. Uh, the data generated can help improve their, their credit worthiness. And in doing all, uh, by doing all this, they, they could also then incentivize these firms to formalize because now they want to, to get access to e-commerce platforms and other, other technologies, but to do so, they have to formalize. And there are other technologies like this uh, in, in, in sectors like ride hailing and domestic work. So, uh, a paper in this volume looks at uh, uh, very detailed admin data from an e-commerce platform in South Asia to actually show that uh, both formal and informal firms that join these platforms tend to see benefits in terms of expanded sales and, and their market reach. And both, both formal and informal firms seem to be benefiting equally. So, so this chart shows the, the how a firm that's on the platform, how its monthly revenue per employee grows with, with time spent on the platform in terms of months. And you can see here that both uh, informal and formal firms on the platform are, are seeing a, a, a rise in their monthly revenue uh, in the first 15 months or so of joining the platform. Similarly, the number of zip codes in which they are selling, which can be a measure of their spatial market access, that's also increasing. And the uh, interesting point is that both the informal and formal firms seem to show the same, uh, so the same performance improvement over time. But this is not a uh, silver bullet, as Murati was saying. Two reasons. First, this paper observes that there is a low survival rate of firms on the platform. So in this chart, you see that uh, the probability that a firm joined the platform uh, that still and it's, it survives on the platform goes down over time by say month 20 an informal firm has only a 50 percent chance or so of survival and it's slightly lower than that of a formal firm the second issue is that uh, the firms that are on this platform are actually not your typical informal firm what this table basically shows that i summarize it quickly that if you compare an informal firm on a digital platform to a typical small business in, in india then the the firm that's on the platform has a, has a younger, more educated manager. And they're also more likely to be female, uh, female owned. So it's not your typical informal firm. And this leads to this thought that maybe uh, some informal firms need complementary skills or credit to actually benefit from platforms. And our OMU chapter discusses this and evidence on this. Um, there are interventions to provide these, these things and, and there is some promising evidence there. But there is, it's also possible that there are many informal firms that will never be able to take advantage of these opportunities. And instead, they will just face competition from, from, from platforms. The last message is about how to address the vulnerability of the informal sector. And, and we say here that you need a multifaceted approach that combines uh, contributory and non-contributory schemes to, uh, and that recognizes the heterogeneous savings capacity of informal workers. To, to reduce vulnerability in the informal sector. So uh, just again to unpack this message, first point is that uh, one of the papers in this uh, volume shows that um, informal workers are disproportionately vulnerable to shocks. So we look at uh, what happened during COVID the lockdown, and we find that informal workers uh, had a 6% higher uh, chance of, of losing their uh, job during the lockdown than formal workers in the same uh, district and industry. Because they are in the, working in the same type of job, we think that this difference is really due to informality. And, um, and similarly, self-employed workers also had a greater chance of losing their jobs than uh, formal workers, but to a lesser extent. So there is this vulnerability in the informal sector. Uh, at the same time, those who work in the informal sector lack access to formal safety nets, uh, in, in particular to social insurance programs that can help uh, cover risks such as, such as job loss, illness, injury, and old age. And this chart here shows that uh, South Asia has, has relatively wide coverage of social assistance programs. So these are, these are non-contributory uh, anti-poverty programs, right? Um, 
but the coverage of social insurance programs, which, which often tend to be uh, contributory programs, like pension programs, that's relatively low. And we, the point we make here is that now there, there is heterogeneity in income and savings capacity in the informal sector. And so you need a multifaceted approach to, uh, to fill this gap. Um, so the first approach is to, let's start with uh, from the bottom, right? There are, there are existing non-contributory uh, schemes targeted, uh, targeted at the poor and uh, consider expanding them. You can increase their benefit levels and also expand their coverage. And there's a paper in this, uh, in this volume which, which analyzes this and it, it reaches the conclusion that countries will really face a tough policy choice in terms of determining what is affordable to them and they'll have to set benefit levels and coverage uh, and eligibility requirements accordingly. So this paper focuses on the case of pensions. And uh, so if you, just to illustrate a bit more, this graph here uh, shows uh, their estimates of the total cost of pension programs if, you, if each of these countries were to expand the, the, the coverage and benefit levels of existing programs substantially. So you expand coverage to 50% of the retirement age population and, and, and the benefit level to enable them to reach at least the poverty level. And the cost is, is increases substantive. Uh, you know, for the compared to the baseline, I think this is like more than ten times. You know? So it's, it's uh, because part of it is because the population is also aging over time. So over time, that's naturally going to make these programs expensive. So you need uh, something else besides this. Right? Um, so this other approach to start from the top, there are there are contributory pension programs, and and countries in South Asia are already thinking of ways to expand them, make them more open to the informal sector. And uh, the point that this paper makes here is that actually there are uh, there are households in the informal sector that may have the savings capacity to contribute to such programs. So this chart here shows in Pakistan the share of households that had uh, net worth equal to at least five years of their consumption needs, they could meet five years of consumption needs by these by through these assets uh, was, was quite substantial. So in 2001, 20 percent of these households had uh, accumulated enough to pay for five years of consumption. Uh, by age of by age 65 and in 2018 this went up to 25 percent but but they also see that a lot of this was locked up in illiquid real estate so and they suggest that uh, you need to design programs that that is tailored to the segment and you know they have the capacity to save but maybe they lack access to the, to the right financial instrument or or the incentives or knowledge to contribute to this program so mm, so I'll conclude with some uh, final summarizing thoughts and just to recap what we spoke about. So after almost three decades of growth, informality is still pervasive in South Asia and ignoring the, its complex causes and consequences means you're ignoring a central development issue. And a clear message from this volume is that there is a need to shift the policy focus away from just reducing informality because it's a hindrance to development uh, towards removing the underlying constraints to improve the lives of informal workers and the conditions and growth opportunities for informal firms. So this is the hidden potential that we speak of. And these efforts need to consider the heterogeneity of the informal sector in terms of sector, industry, income and wealth quintiles, skills, ability to save, and other things that, that we saw in the presentation. And if you recognize the heterogeneity of the informal sector and uh, adapt policy interventions uh, to different cases, that's really important for both more inclusive growth and also for making it growth more resilient. Thank you. I will stop here. Thank you, Siddharth. Thank you, Mauricio. I think it was wonderful. I think the message-driven presentation that you made was very good. I think it will the messages will stay imprint in our mind for a long time. So very good. And I just wanted to make sure that you know that there are 34 people connected online. That's a pretty good number of people out there who are listening to the presentation. Uh, so I think while you guys now change the setup and uh, set up the panel, I guess we'll wait for a few minutes uh, and then we'll start the panel discussion. So anyway, let me just thank uh, both Mauricio and Siddharth for a very good presentation. And I hope uh, during the Q&A session, you'll stay back and answer uh, some of the questions related to the report. We have got a few uh, questions already in the chat box, um, which I'll pass on to somebody uh, to respond uh, to this. So 
So let's wait for a few seconds until they get the stage set up for the next session. Thank you very much. I request the panelists for the panel discussion to kindly move to the stage, please. So over to you, Mr. Varadwas, to get us started. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Anil Bharadwaj, and I am Secretary General with Federation of Indian Micro, Small, and Medium Enterprises. Any discussion on informal economy? Uh, the first question itself is that how do you capture uh, the term informal economy? What do we really mean by that? And that reminds me uh, of uh, Nando de Soto, the other path, uh, when he says that uh, informal economy is the spontaneous and creative response and creative and creative response uh, of people against the failure of the state in providing the basic necessities to its um, uh, impoverished. I may try this. So I was quoting Ananda De Soto when he says that uh, uh, informal economy is a spontaneous and creative response of the failure of the state in providing the basic necessities to its own, uh, uh, impoverished masses. Uh, and informal economy manifests itself in many dimensions, but the three or four more important dimensions are housing that we can see that you now Juggies and you know the shanties come up as people from countryside come to the cities. It manifests itself in the form of informal businesses and also in transport. But there are of course dimensions of education and health, but three important dimensions which are intertwined in uh, uh, today's discussions are housing, business, and transport. Uh, how much it is because of choice and how much it is because of the exclusion created by society, especially the regulation. That's an important thing. Maybe the choices are determined also to some extent or rather to a large extent by the regulations. So today uh, we are going to have a discussion on this issue and uh, the panelists to help us unravel the current study and also understand some of the basic important underlying uh, uh, assertions that have come from the study. Uh, let me introduce, first of all, Radhika Kapoor. Uh, she's a senior visiting fellow at ICREA and she worked at the Planning Commission an International Labor Organization. She has a degree in economics from St. Stephen College, Delhi University a master's and PhD degree in economics from Cambridge University and London School of Economics, respectively. Uh, we have Kanika Bhatnagar, is a World Bank country economist for India. Previously, she was the lead economist for Malaysia and Philippines for a Engine Bank. Uh, she also worked in NCER. Uh, she has master of philosophy in economics from Jawaharlal Nehru University and master's in economics from Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics, GIP Pune. I also have uh, with me Mr. Pranab Sen, who is PhD in economics from John Hopkins University. And most recently has been a principal advisor of power and energy at the Government of India Planning Commission. And also had uh, positions as the first chief statistician of India. As a representative of Planning Commission, he was principal author and coordinator of midterm appraisal of eighth, ninth, five-year plans and midterm appraisal of ninth, five-year plan also. 
And finally, we have uh, Mr. Soumya Kanti Ghosh, who, is, uh, who has joined us online, uh, who's a Group Chief Economic Advisor, State Bank of India, and has worked with Tata AIA and American Express and ICRA. Dr. Ghosh received his PhD in economics from Jawaharlal Nehru University. So before uh, uh, we come to the more specific and granular questions, let me uh, give the opportunity to all the panelists to share with us that what are the broad themes that they have got, broad messages they have got from the study, mm -hmm. and how this study fulfills or illuminates our understanding in areas which the earlier studies so far have not done. And let me begin with Radhika Kapoorji. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, let me begin by congratulating both Siddharth and Maritza for an absolutely excellent report. Firstly, we're delighted that you put together this report on informality, because frankly, the subject gets far less attention than it truly deserves in the policy discourse in South Asia. Um, secondly, I think that the message of this report is exceedingly important, and you presented it so beautifully, so I hope it's not lost on policymakers in particular. Um, you know, the key message, and I will repeat this, was that there is hidden potential in the informal economy. There's a need for policy to shift this focus from just reducing informality because it is a hindrance towards removing underlying constraints. Uh, to my mind, actually, you know, your, your report and the analysis essentially questions um, the, the fundamental policy discourse that has happened around the subject in informality. Because what we always talk about is that let's, you know, how do you reduce informality? How do you formalize the informal sector? So the discourse has just focused on uh, enabling a transition from informal uh, to formal. And of course, you know, that's a desirable objective. I mean, let me put it up front. There's nothing wrong with that. We do want that transition to happen. It's, it's ex exceedingly important from a fiscal perspective as well, because you want all these tax judges to be in, in the formal sector. But the trouble with this approach is is that you know when we what is this policy discourse actually driven by it's driven by the belief uh, that essentially everybody who is in the informal sector is a tax dodger they're either trying to evade registration they're trying to evade paying taxes and you know they are what you put in the category of the evaders and the avoiders in your theoretical framework and these people have to be pushed to formalize, they have to be compelled to formalize, and there are various methods of doing that. You reduce the cost of registration, or you actually mandate them to, to register. But if you actually look at South Asia, and I can say this with you know, a certain degree of confidence about India, having worked um, with, with a lot of the data uh, on, on the firm side and the employment side, is that actually a vast number of enterprises which are in the informal sector are not actually these tax dodgers. I mean, these firms are simply the tip of the iceberg in the informal sector. A vast majority of firms, particularly the micro and small enterprises, which are in the informal sector, either they are there because they are simply subsistence enterprises, because they cannot you know, um, a lot of these people, especially own account enterprises, they haven't been able to find jobs in the formal sector. So in order to survive and subsist, they have to work in informal enterprises, particularly own account enterprises uh, in the informal sector. So if there was, in fact, you know, more labor intensive growth in the formal sector, a lot of these people would get absorbed there. But then you also have certain enterprises. Uh, and you know, in the data uh, in India, we have the NSS Unincorporated Enterprise Survey, where you call them establishments. They hire anywhere between one to nine workers. There are a lot of these enterprises which do have links with uh, formal firms. Uh, they are low productivity enterprises. For these firms, it is, you know, they it's not like they're not in the informal sector, you said, because they want to evade or avoid, but because for them, they're just very low productivity and it doesn't make sense for them to be in the formal sector. So the question then is that, what do you do about these firms? I mean, and like you said, it is about removing the underlying constraints they face. It's about enhancing their productivity. 
The question, of course, is that, you know, what should be those specific um, policy options that we should focus on to enhance their productivity? Uh, because all we keep talking about is how do we just push them into the formal sector? And there's very little discussion on how we enhance their productivity in a manner that when their productivity increases, that actually enables an organic path of formalization, as opposed to pushing them to formalize through some regulation. At the end of the day, formalization as we understand it as we see it in the data is seen in a legal sense but actually in the structural transformation framework in the Louisian framework it's about productivity it's about enhancing your productivity so how do we enhance productivity of a lot of these firms in the informal sector and some of these guys who are in the informal sector actually have a lot of potential to be dynamic transformative entrepreneurs if they are given the right support uh, I don't know if you've uh, seen these papers because I haven't seen the entire reference list of your uh, report, but it's worth looking at two papers in this context, you know, uh, which have come out of the ILO. So there's um, a paper by Professor Rajiv Ghosh, which actually shows that there has been productivity growth in India, the informal sector between 99, 2000 and 2011, 12. Uh, there's another paper by, by Noman again, who Noman Majid, who's also at the ILO, and he again makes a similar point where he talks about productivity growth in the informal sector. In fact, he goes a step ahead and he says that, you know, in, in, in the Lewis framework, what you talk about structural transformation is the movement from low productivity to high productivity, from informal to formal. But in labor surplus economies, it is not the, the first transition may well not happen from the informal to the formal. The first transition may happen within the informal sector because there is so much heterogeneity within the informal sector. There is scope for moving from low productivity activities in the informal sector to higher productivity activities in the informal sector. And we see evidence of that happening even in the NSS Unincorporated Enterprise Survey when, where you can compare value added per worker across enterprises of different sizes. So I think this message is exceedingly important. It questions the basic discourse that we have around formalization. And, and I think that you know the, the only um, thing I hope we discuss a bit more, and we'd like to hear more from you today is, and of course, you know, Dr. Pranab Sen is here, he'll be able to offer very effective, effective policy prescriptions, is how do you actually enhance uh, the productivity of this, 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 how do you tap that untapped potential or enhance the productivity of informal enterprises? I mean, I agree with you, you know, the digital platforms is definitely one way. In fact, at ICRIR, we're doing this study, which looks at, um, Okay, I can continue speaking. Okay, uh, you know, we, we have this study where we are looking at the impact of uh, integration of e-commerce platforms on MSMEs. Uh, but but like you said, you know, this needs the entire support structure. It needs access to technology. It needs access to credit, access to skills and so on. But what I want to point out is that, you know, the digital platforms, and I'm not talking about e-commerce here, but digital platforms, while they are, like you said, providing a pathway for informal firms to formalize, it's important to remember that informality or informal uh, employment as we know it as defined by the ILO is not just the employment which is in the informal sector, it is also the informal employment which is in the formal sector. A lot of these so therefore, there is informality, which is coming from the enterprise side, and there's also informality, which is coming from employer-employee arrangements. And a lot of the digital platforms, what they are doing is actually informalizing the employer-employee arrangements. So while they are providing firms a pathway to formalize, and certain kinds of firms only, but there is the downside that they will informalize employer-employee arrangements and also lead to a rise in informal employment, maybe outside uh, the formal sector. And in fact, in India, it's it, it's worth noting that if you if you track the data over time, you know we've done this from 99 2000 onwards, when you can actually start calculating these things about informal sector and formal employment, you are seeing a decline in the share of employment in the informal sector. It's gone down from about 89% to 81 odd percent. But what you have seen happen concomitantly is that there has been an informalization of employment arrangements in the formal sector. So when you combine that enterprise-based definition of informality with the employment-based definition, what you're finding is that informality has basically remained static uh, for, for three decades uh, in India. So that's that's one point that I wanted to, to, to highlight here. And uh, 
uh, I think uh, maybe in the second round we can take up like that. Okay, okay. And so I think maybe, you know, the, the, the other thing we can talk about later is what has been the impact of COVID and why this report becomes even more important in a post-COVID world. Uh, because what we've seen and what we've seen in India, and Soumya Kanti is here, I'm sure he'll talk about it, is that on the GDP, the output side, you may well argue that the share of informal in output in GDP has declined. He's put out some numbers there. Uh, but on the employment side, there has been a rise in informality. This is you know, corroborated by government data, by PLFS. So what we're seeing is a new kind of dualism. We are seeing uh, a structural transformation where there is a decline in the share of informality on the output on the production side. But on the labor side, we're actually seeing an increase. Uh, that increase is happening not just because people are losing their jobs in the formal sector and they're being pushed into the informal sector, but also because in the formal sector, there's a lot of informalization which is happening uh, because firms are trying to save costs that they have to incur in social security of formal workers. And I guess the question then also is that what is really now going to be the new formal job? Because formal jobs, as we perhaps understand them, is permanent jobs. Uh, may, you know, like having that yardstick for defining a formal job may just be too stringent. We're not going to see too many jobs of those kinds. So we also need to rethink uh, the idea of a formal uh, job in, in the world today. That discussion, of course, you know, started even before COVID in the context of technological changes and uh, digital platforms. So I think for now, I'll stop there. Thank you, Radhika. Uh, so the message that I get from you is that uh, uh, one of the main reasons for persistence in formality remains that, you know, we are not creating enough formal jobs in economy. And as a matter of fact, uh, even if the production is rising, you said, uh, the formal jobs are diminishing or are getting reduced, and there are more one are getting created in informal economy. Uh, at the same time, what you that's why perhaps what you are saying is that, you know, many of the interventions have not worked well. Uh, this interventionist approach uh, to set things right uh, may not work, and rather we have to look at the binding constraints that are there at the informal sector level. Uh, let me come to you, uh, Mr. Sain. And uh, uh, first of all, let me ask uh, the question that how uh, comfortable are you with uh, the, the definition that this study has chosen? Uh, well, I have to steal the... <clears throat> um, there is no one de single definition, I think, in the study from what I could gather. Um, to look at fairly carefully, um, the notions of informality will vary, whether you're talking about enterprises or you're talking about workers. Um, and I think that's, that's the right way to go. The point is, uh, are we really looking at the intersection between these definitions? Uh, because in a sense, one can have uh, formal enterprises with informal labor, Randika was talking about, they've talked about it. You have informal enterprises with informal labor. The real question is, can you have informal enterprises with formal labor? And in a certain sense, we do. And this is really where the, the big question arises. The notion of formality that is sort of embedded, in, not just in, in this, this study, in, in our discourse at large, is formalization in terms of contractualization of relationships, right? That is something which is really of a fairly <clears throat> recent origin in a lot of our countries. Most of our countries for the longest time possible, we had very formal relationships, but these were embedded in the traditional cultural norms of, <clears throat> of relationships which were enforced by communities, which did not make them informal. Under today's definition, those would be treated as informal. Okay, But that's not true. And the reason I'm bringing this up is really because one of the things that I found uh, uh, interesting was the way they defined heterogeneity. See, the whole heterogeneity and the definition that was used was heterogeneity within informality. That is causes of informality. But heterogeneity is, is far more fundamental than that. I think a lot of the informal, informality that we see in India is rooted in heterogeneity itself. 
And the kind of heterogeneity I'm talking about are the social and cultural mores and the way they are spread out over this country. South Asia is probably one of the most heterogeneous regions in the world. Hmm? So it's not just the traditional practices, tastes and preferences differ over very short distances. Right? Now, if you have heterogeneous tastes, tastes and preferences, what you're going to get are situations where production enterprises cannot address a larger market because they're hitting boundaries on the, the tastes and preferences. Hmm? And it is then, in fact, rational for them to want to remain small. Not because they're trying to evade taxes, but that's the way they see their market. The point is that with time, and you know, this brings us to the issue, for instance, of what digitalization is doing, what you do get is a greater degree of homogenization of tastes and preferences, particularly in urban areas. In peri-urban, semi-urban, and rural areas, the heterogeneity contain, continues unabated. Now, if this is the nature of enterprises, it is no wonder that 99% of enterprises are informal because they're catering to very local, very precisely defined markets, which are specifically being targeted given their capacity to produce what they're producing. So, this is much more difficult to tackle because what you're then talking about is not a policy response. What you're talking about then, and this becomes a much larger social discourse, is do you want homogeneity as a direction that you would want the nation to go? Or is heterogeneity something to be preserved and valued? If it is, live with informality. I have an additional point here sure. uh, to ask and, uh, for your comment. Uh, for example, for the typology, what uh, has been used is uh, regul compliance with the regulation has been taken as a reference point. So you have formal enterprises, you have evaders, you have avoiders, and then you have people below threshold. But the problem uh, in, at the ground is that, you know, the same enterprise is avoiding a, a law and is avoiding another. And maybe below a threshold, a certain other law. For example, look at the labor law. So even if you have one employee, you're, you come under the law of minimum wages. But uh, if you have more than 10 employees, then you have of, you get covered under EPF law or provident fund laws and so on and so forth under the Factories Act. So the point is that it's very difficult to neatly categorize them as avoiders and, and evaders because there's a lot of overlap uh, between, uh, I mean, these categories and, and enterprises actually uh, or... or uh, uh, the natural functioning would not uh, respect the boundaries that we have created of avoiders and evaders. How do you respond? No, I, I, you're absolutely right. I'm just to give you a very simple example. If you look at the process of skill development in this country, the formal skill development system practically doesn't exist. It's useless. It's done almost entirely through the informal enterprises. Most, almost all skill development in the country. Hmm? So what's happening there? Somebody is coming in. You're taking a raw, untrained person, starting to put him to work so that he learns on the job. At that level, you do not have a formal def definition of apprenticeship. He is immediately categorized as a worker. And then comes under the minimum law. Now, this guy has virtually zero productivity. But you, if you have to pay him minimum wages, you're finished. Right? Now, it's this process and the understanding of this relationship, which is critically important. And it also explains the point that Radhika was making, right? Which is that the bulk of movement, upward movement, happens within the informal sector. Precisely because of that, because people are moving from completely unskilled to a little bit of skill, moving to an enterprise which can then give the take into a higher skill level and so on. And at which stage do you say that the various formal laws shall start applying becomes critical determinant of how smoothly this process operates? 
Thank you. So, Kadikaji, your take on the study? No. Sort of peers with the students. Um, I, I'm sorry to add something meaningful to the discussion. Um, first of all, I would uh, again like to congratulate the authors on, on this terrific um, report on informality. Um, uh, and a very comprehensive work uh, on the topic uh, so far on South Asia. Um, and what I really appreciate about the report and something that uh, Dr. Kapoor also mentioned, it's the heterogeneity that the authors have considered. They've not taken informality as a monolithic concept. They've taken it as a heterogeneous concept and uh, taken the classification uh, given by Kanbur on uh, the avoiders, evaders, and uh, uh, and the outsiders. Uh, the, the couple of uh, sort of questions slash uh, points uh, here. Um, when when we talk about the, uh, uh, the, the argument, whether it's choice or exclusion uh, that has uh, sort of um, driven uh, the informal sector, the persistence that has contributed to the persistence and the vastness of the informal sector in, in the region. Uh, and this is again something that has already been mentioned. Is it the byproduct of the inadequate demand in the formal sector that has driven uh, the, the the informal sector to such sort of levels? Um, and here, uh, the, the fact that the there there has been a movement from uh, low skilled sort of uh, from less skilled agriculture. Uh, the, uh, the agriculture sector to sort of low skilled and low productivity uh, sectors of traditional market services, which is trade, which is hospitality, which is transport. Uh, and more generally, uh, th that is your mom and pop stores uh, around the corner or uh, the street side hawkers or uh, street side vendors. Uh, the question then comes whether it is not about choice or exclusion, whether it's just the inadequate demand in in the formal sector that has contributed to this informal uh this this high share of informal sector and we at sort of uh my team and i we have been working um at the bank on uh, the uh, on the labor market dynamics and informal sector of course is a very much uh, a big and important part of the discussion and what we have found in our preliminary sort of results is that formalization um, is very positively associated with a greater higher share of manufacturing uh, sector across the Indian states. Um, so then is it a reflection of your deficient demand in the formal sector that has contributed to it? But that is not to say that the supply side issues do not matter. Of course, uh, uh, the the report also sort of draws linkages between uh, child nutrition and uh, the socio emotional uh, sort of skills that lead to better labor market outcomes. And this is something that we also found that uh, increased formalization is associated with education level, is associated with higher sort of access to uh, social infrastructure across Indian states. But the question then is that whether the deficient demand in the formal sector the inability of the creation of uh, more formal jobs in the sector has that resulted uh, has that played a sort of pivotal role in in uh, in, uh, in in contributing to the uh, uh, higher share of informal sector in the country um, the second point um, or question <laughs> as you may take it um, is uh, the report talks about the business regulatory reforms and how uh, they it, it, it has had a muted impact on, on the informal sector. And in addition to business regulatory reforms, there's also the authors also recognize that there are hidden entry costs and labor tax that uh, that sort of has an impact on the evaders and the avoiders. Uh, here, it may uh, be it, it might be perhaps prudent to talk about the de jure and de facto labor regulations. Um, the uh, what, what we found so far is that even if the states ease the labor regulations, uh, which of course is an over and above cost on the business registration costs, even if the states ease the labor regulations, there is no positive 
uh, or there's very insignificant relationship with uh, the increase in manufacturing employment or output across the Indian states. And that might be because of the de facto cost it imposes. And there's an excellent paper, I think, by uh, Amirapu and Getcher, which uh, basically uh, draws, uh, which uh, find the positive relationship between the distortionary uh, impact of labor regulations and the uh, governance quality of regulatory enforcement. And this is somewhat uh, um, sort of validated by the World Bank Enterprise Survey results, which albeit is for the formal sector, but it tells you that uh, corruption is actually the uh, most significant constraint uh, cited by the surveyed firms and not labor regulations. Only average, only an average of 6% of uh, surveyed firms found labor regulations to be a significant constraint. So is it the de facto, the, de the inclusion of de facto and de jure sort of uh, regulatory costs would be, a, a, I think, a major addition to the debate. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Kanika. And with this, uh, let me come to you, Mr. Ghosh. Uh, thanks for uh, waiting. A uh, couple of things. For, I mean, one of the main, four uh, messages is the reforms of business regulations tend to have small direct effects on the informal sector. And uh, if we look at it, for example, from our own experiences, also that licensing reforms and ease of doing business have not resulted really easing the life of informal sector, because even if India's, uh, although that World Bank survey is, is, is discontinued, but nevertheless, the last one, uh, the, the report that was there, we have uh, jumped uh, the gun quite a bit and you know, we our ranking is improved tremendously. We uh, almost crossed the 50 points, but the informality increased. It has not decreased, uh, number one. And number two, uh, I mean, FISMA is working, for example, in, in one of the cities near Delhi, uh, Meerut, which approximately has 12 uh, clusters. It's a cluster, mega cluster of 12 clusters, which includes uh, brass bands, sports codes, Caesar cluster, and so on and so forth. And we found that the greatest uh, barrier for, for in, in the way of formalization are municipal laws. So whatever we have done so far either is on the external side that is uh, easing uh, on the trade part of it after 1991, or maybe at the at the national level, but not much has been done at the municipal level. And second is, let me uh, also mention about the credit. It is increasingly said that, you know, to uh, can say contain informalization or to formalize enterprises, we should improve their access to credit. And credit is definitely a very important issue. But uh, our experience is that credit is, uh, uh, what should I say, uh, a necessary, but, but not the sufficient condition. Uh, in the sense that, you know, if you look at South Asia, and of course, including India, uh, the access to finance had tremendously been eased through uh, microfinance institutions in Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka also. But the informality has increased. So uh, should we also say that we, when, uh, I mean, these two are not the silver bullets and we have to see the other binding factors, for example, municipal laws uh, in order to ease the situation. Your response. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I will just start state away. I think uh, with this debate on formality and informality, I have a slightly different take on this subject. Uh, this is not to deny that there's, exist a significant informality in the labor market in the Indian context. But let me put out some things in the perspective, because I think you also discussed about the credit access and so on. Let me give out some hard data this year, and then I'll talk to you about which is basically in the public domain. If you look into the credit growth this year of the banks, I think that is around now incremental terms that is now around close to 10 lakh crores uh, till October. And of this, I think more than 15% is going to the MSME sector, which is a huge jump from last year. We can have the numbers. I can share the numbers after the debate. So that shows that this debate on credit that the MSME is not getting credit is somehow misplaced. And in fact, 
the most important thing about this year's credit growth is that the large segment of the MSME sector is actually getting credit. And, uh, and the scheme which the government had launched in terms of the ECLGS scheme, because we have actually worked, because our bank had a significant share, we saw that a large part of the firms actually took the credit to save themselves from extension. There were some numbers which I've shared. I think that report is also in public domain. So I'll not share about that report. But another, so this is one part of the data. The second part is that another data which would be a little bit dated, but from August 18 till March 21, I think that was during the peak of the pandemic, 2020, just before the pandemic. If you look into these NSS um, uh, survey of FI 16, I think we all of us know there was 633.9 lakh unincorporated non-agricultural MSMEs. If you look into the GST portal from August 18 till March 21, the total number of new MSMEs which were incorporated is 499.4 lakhs. And if you look to the turnover, 99% of these lie under the MSME category. So this means that 494 lakh crores new MSME actually were brought under the GST regime. So this is no wonder that even during the peak of the pandemic and even during the current uh, the last couple of months, I think GST collection have consistently topped 1 lakh crores. We can, of course, debate that these numbers currently last month numbers are 1.5 lakh crores. We can, of course, debate that a part of this number could be because inflated because of the uh, inflation numbers. Yes, it could be. But even if you adjust for the inflation numbers, the GST collections today is actually around 1.25 to 1.3 lakh crores. So that actually talks a large part of the formality of the labor. I think uh, Dr. Kapoor mentioned about the study which we had done in 2021. Yes, in that study, actually, we had shown, and uh, I think that report is again in public domain, so I'll not get into that, wherever you've shown that the share of the informal sector. There was some IMF study in 2018, which talked about 50%. There we had actually uh, shown that the share could have significantly dropped. But in the same report, also we have said that there are two parts of the informality formality debate in India. One is the formalization of the consumption which is happening. The other is the informality of the labor, which may not be growing at the same place. I think there are reports and this report actually has been very fascinating because I congratulate the author also in the sense that one of the numbers is very striking, which shows that if the same level of uh, inf uh, uh, definition is applied, the level of informality in the US economy could be even higher. So, and also the suggestions which has been given. So I will also talk a little bit about the suggestions. But the point to note is that, yes, we agree that the informality of the labor has not expanded at the same pace, but the economy is getting formalized. But here again, uh, if you just give me some numbers, I think these reports which we had published have generated a lot of interest. But one number which is very important for us, and uh, I think I'll just be, uh, put out some numbers. I think in 2018, we had published a report on the uh, payroll numbers, and it was actually created a lot of critical debate. I think there was uh, both sides of the coin. Well, I mean, and, uh, in terms of uh, the some of the fallacies of the estimates and so on. But if you look into very closely at the data, and if you look into the numbers, and the break up the numbers into, I think the main criticism of that argument was that a large part of the day, I mean, if, if you are less than 20 number of employees, they're already over there. So it is not creation of a new job. But if you very carefully look into the EPFO portal, there is a number which says that how many of the firms are actually coming into the new stream, which is basically based on the challenge receipt. And if you break up the total number of net new EPF subscribers in terms of formalization, the persons who are getting formalized, the persons who are getting second job, and the person who are giving, getting a first job, the number actually are revealing, which shows that over the period of the last, I think, four years, the total net EPF subscribers, this is basically first job, second job, and formalization. So basically, if one wants to argue, we can always say that getting a second job is basically uh, those who are getting the first job, that should be counted as actual new payroll. Even after taking that into account, if you take the sum of first job, second job, and the percent extent of formalization, the total number of formalized labor is actually around 50.9 lakhs. And that is out of a total number of EPF subscribers of these three summation is 513.7 lakhs. So that means around 10% of the labor force has, has been formalized over the same period. 
there are several other data sources which I would not like to get into, but uh, for example, the other data source, which is often, I think, creates a lot of debate is uh, the currency circulation data. If you do an trend line estimates, you will find that the currency circulation and compared with FI11 and FI22, if you don't take that pandemic into induced decline in GDP, the currency circulation today would have been at 10.8%, which is lower than 12.1%, which was in FI11. Now, another point which you rightly mentioned is the formulation of the credit. Yes, the formulation of credit is an important point, but and also the fact that in the agriculture sector, if you look into the number of Kishan credit cards, the new incremental Kishan credit cards, which has been rolled out over the last four years, you will see that the significant part of this agricultural, I think, sector credit is also getting formalized. Because earlier, what used to happen, there was a lot of informal credit. Yes, there has been a lot of informal credit. But if you look into the KCC increment, and this number is also there in our presentation, if you look into the number of increment new KCC cards, which, the, which has been rolled out. And if you multiply with an average credit, which has been given by the Schiedel commercial banks, you will find that there also there has been a significant extent of, extent of formalization. So the point to note over here is that, yes, there are two distinct shifts. The economy is getting rapidly formalized. Possibly the laborers, the formalization of the labor contract and the heterogeneity, what we have been talking about, may not have taken at same place, but it may not be completely correct to say that the informal laborers still are at significantly higher levels of 80% or 85%. If you look into another, for example, the number on the Ishram portal, uh, the, the, which gives and that is the number today, which was rolled out in August 2021. That number is today as 28.4 crores. So, and I also have a little bit of uh, the objection to the definition of the informality of labor, because if I understand it correctly, and if people can correct me, Professor can correct me if I'm wrong, is that if a person, if an in a person is considered to be a formal employer from an informal, if he gets any of the government benefits. So for example, tomorrow, if the 28.4 puts people are entitled to a government benefit of an insurance, will he consider all of them as formalized without a labor contract? I don't think that may be a correct way of interpreting the thing. And okay. finally, uh, I think one of the things, and this is also a fascinating part of the paper, which I completely agree with, is that uh, there should be steps taken to ensure that these the informal labor contracts and the informal laborers are actually get a better deal. I think this is one thing which is lacking in the Indian context in the policy making. I will take the example, as all of you know, that the UPI transactions today have jumped by 70%. And this was the first time in the history that the currency circulation had declined during the early week. We found out from the data. The UK government and the Monetary Authority of Singapore actually enables setting up a public cloud. The most important thing is the Monetary Authority of Singapore enables setting up a public cloud services for harnessing and analyzing data of financial institutions. We have today hordes and hordes of data on UPI transactions. And why can't these UPI transactions can be used as a transformative resources for real-time policy and evidences policy making? I think if you look at the example of the UK government during the pandemic, the UK government actually had the right to recall the data from the telecommunication provider so as to get so 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 that they could have given the services to the deserving citizens. I remember that was the Coronavirus Act of 2020. So I think recently there was a debate in the Indian context of this uh, the sharing of public data for obedience based policy making. I think this is one important thing which you all policymakers should think of that these huge swaths of data in terms of these digital transactions which you are now getting and the banks also, I mean, in the Indian context, the regulatory architecture doesn't also allow the banks to... Mr. So Ghosh, uh, I'm afraid we'll have yes. to wind it up, please. Yes, I'll just wind up. Uh, doesn't allow the banks to store data in the cloud form. So I think one of the good thing which could be taken out from this research study is that why don't have a policy debate on how to use this data for evidence-based policy making. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have, I think, uh, still a couple of minutes to take up questions. Uh, so I'll read out the questions and uh, ask uh, any of the panelists who like, they would like to respond. They should respond. The <laughs> ah, yeah, this is respond. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Would you like to uh, respond from there? Yeah, please. 
So uh, the first question is from Arti Reddy. Uh, in estimating the direct impacts of reforms, how does one account for the role of small informal firms in providing essential services and the market linkages and dependencies of the formal sector, which are not accounted for when using traditional measures of productivity? This is one question. Let me read out the second one also. Is there an estimation on the number of informal enterprises in each country? Is there an estimation of the number of informal enterprises in each country? And uh, is there a standard definition of informality? And third is uh, from Sunita Raju. How will the change in definition of MSME in terms of investment last year affect the productivity and employment discussions? Would you like to speak? Uh, let's let's have first three, and then if we have time, we can. Yeah. Can you can you hear? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, um, all right. So the let, let me before before I answer is can I answer also one other important uh, point that was made that I, I think by uh, Radhika uh, in her in her intervention that is uh, um, the the fact that uh, we we have uh, we have thought about this. Uh, inside this uh, this uh, study and also uh, on another another project about the fact that the, uh, the digital economy and, and especially e-commerce and um, and also other platforms in the labor market uh, uh, they have uh, especially for high income countries create informalization of of labor market relationship uh, the classical example is uh, 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 how Uber has uh, basically uh, modified uh, in, a, in, a, in a permanent fashion of the uh, taxi riding and relationship. Uh, uh, so you call about a relationship with an employer and I believe you talk about the Uberization. Etc. So clearly uh, the literature uh, and the debate has been that these, uh, these platform have uh, broken certain traditional formal relationship and informalize this, this, this market. But there is almost no evidence of what happens in uh, uh, developing countries. And in fact, a lot of the, a lot of the sectors where ride hailing is one, one but the, uh, uh, grocery shopping uh, and services of other type uh, like um, um, uh, uh, home cleaning, uh, uh, personal services in developing countries tend to be highly informal to begin. With. So that you know that uh, it's not that the platform arrives and destroy formal relationships and substitute them with informal relationships. But but there is not enough evidence. And in fact, we did uh, we did run uh, uh, a couple of uh, surveys in the in platforms. One was an e-commerce. Uh, uh, it's, it's called the RAS, which operates in multiple countries. Another one is Chaldal, which is, operates in Bangladesh. And a third one is a ride hailing uh, platform that operates in uh, Pikmi, that operates in Sri Lanka. And we have asked in this, in this survey whether um, firms or workers that join this platform were shifting the way they do business more towards a formal way of doing business than an informal way. And it's not, it's not easy to do that. And, and it goes, again, to answer a little bit of the other question. Uh, so the main, the main thing is that for firms is the separation of uh, personal assets from assets used for production, basically incorporation. Once someone operates in a way, in such a way that uses the car just for business and doesn't take the family uh, during the weekend or, or for consumption, there is this separation, then it's a step toward formalization. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, uh, so we see that happening. It's difficult to, it's difficult to point the finger, but we, we see this happening 
when when some of the firms, small firm, join join the platform. The other one is uh, on um, on on the labor market is even higher there. Um, but one one example of formalization is the unionization. Now the pygmy drivers are not unionized, but they communicate between themselves and they feel that somehow that they have a more collective bargaining position towards their uh, their employer than any of the taxi driver or or, or re ratio uh, tuk tuk driver had before. So there are ways that we observe that is not the the platform is not simply destroying formal relationships, but is standardizing relationship and is is moving people towards operating in a more form. But there is much more to be done. And I don't want to uh, just just uh, simply say that uh, these these uh, these platforms only do good because they also squeeze margin out of of the, the small guys. So there are and they have and they tend to have monopolistic uh, uh, power on, on market. So it's it's not all good. Okay, so that's an important point that I want to make. The, the, um, uh, there are no. There is the. There isn't. Uh, uh, it's in terms of uh, data on informal firms across the region is one big uh, uh, sour point. In fact, uh, uh, India may be the only place where there is there is decent data on on informal firms, but it's not recent either. So we need we need much more uh, data on that. It's it's very difficult statistically to to measure that, but but. We need we need more data on that. And uh, the, as far as the definition goes, uh, I, I said it before. For for firms, it's basically this distinction between assets used for production from assets used from from for for your own consumption, and that becomes harder and harder as you get towards a small a small size because these are family run businesses where it's difficult to, to figure it out. Uh, I, I give you the hard one. Uh, no, thanks to the panelists for really excellent uh, comments and, uh, and and their thoughts on the topic. Uh, you know, again, I, I'm actually going to talk more about what Mauricio just talked about because it's a really interesting interesting issue. So, uh, how technology is changing what we what we think about the, what we think of the firm. And and its relationship with the worker and what is the nature of work. Right? We could we could have written a whole volume on on, on that itself. Uh, but Moritz, you spoke about these sort of different uh, notions of 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 advancing formalization that are that is happening in through these different types of digital platforms. I want to add here that um, even how we think about policy to like regulate firms and work to make work more uh, less vulnerable in in when you are working for a for a for or in a platform, even that's a hard question, and we we need to uh, we need more evidence there and to think about it. Just to mention one of our interesting findings there, which is also been seen in the case of Uber in the U.S., that uh, many drivers join Uber because they value flexibility. They don't necessarily want a nine nine to five job. They have they have another job, but there are some hours which need to be filled and and they want to have the flexibility to choose when to go and drive drive the uber car right? and in this work that we're doing in sri lanka we observe something like that but 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 it's the proportions are different and there seem to be two different types of of drivers on the ride hailing platform uh some of them actually treat it as a as a job but the rest again seem to value flexibility more and so how do you uh, what is your policy towards the platform? Okay. Maybe that needs to take into account this heterogeneity in, in the preferences and, and, and the needs of the people who are working there. So, uh, also, this really interesting point that Dr. Sain raised about um, there's another reason why there are so many small firms. It's just because there is heterogeneity in, in, in tastes, preferences, and, and the market is naturally small. You don't need to be large to, to, uh, uh, to um, to be serving this market, and that's that's a point well taken. So, uh, and, and so in this case, um, I think policy maybe there's no no need for a policy intervention, and, 
And, and so this again speaks to our point that, that when you think of a policy intervention for the informal sector, think about you know, what role that play, firm is playing and, and tailor it to that. So um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, let me respond to the uh, the question that was raised about the definition in the MSME segment and whether it would increase whether it would increase productivity and employment in the formal sector. Yes, definitely. And the reason is this that you know the last definition was last uh, fixed in two thousand six, so it's what naturally inflation uh, existed in two thousand twenty one. Uh, so some increase was naturally desired. And secondly, as they have put the categorization of avoiders, because uh, it was not adjusted to infl inflation, so what was happening was that there was a horizontal growth in the MSME sector uh, in certain categories. For example, uh, the, the two specific segments, uh, I received number of cases in pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. as well as in auto segment. So they wanted to increase, they wanted to uh, 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 we can say import uh, technologies as well as uh, get WHO compliant in order to supply to uh, during COVID also, but they could not get the WHO certification because capital investment was required and this definition was holding them. Now the question was that why, uh, I mean, what was the problem if they remained small? The problem was that, uh, or if they invested on their own and got over the investment limit of MSME. The reason is uh, in public procurement, uh, the segment which is allowed to get access to public procurement is micro and small enterprises only. The moment you cross the small and become medium, this uh, access to public procurement is not available and it is significant. 25% set aside is there in public procurement for MSCs. Uh, I'm afraid that we don't have much time now. Uh, may uh, I add one small point over here? Just I'll give you one uh, 30 seconds. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, uh, just to uh, conclude, one important point which I'd like to say is that uh, in terms of the credit which you talked about, yes, credit is a very important part of the MSME getting them. And, you know, I mean, one of the, I mean, some of the regulations that so, I mean, needs to be changed. For example, I'll just give an example that uh, every time, for example, a bank wants to give loan to an a new GST firm who has a better compliance, tax compliance, he has to go and take the permission of the GST and authorities. So we have been talking repeatedly that this has to be done one time customer consent, but this has, so but this, are, this is a very small thing. And I give an example that how actually helps the, uh, the MSME sector to get credit. So some of the sec some of these things needs to be streamlined and hopefully if this gets streamlined, I think the credit getting the MSME getting access to more and more bank credit and getting formalized would be the best thing to happen in the future. So with that, uh, let me conclude. I'm sorry, I think we can, you're still there? Uh, okay. okay, please, sir. Sir. The last one, maybe. Okay. Okay. And I worked for uh, this informal sector as part of the national street vendors policy and also as part of the master plan for daily uh, my question to the authors who have done a very good presentation i have not seen the report is that whether they have talked to the to the informal sector people maybe street vendors maybe domestic workers etc because the report is highly intellectualized and does not reflect the concerns of the uh, still, uh, maybe in the informal sector truly because of the fact that when we surveyed the informal sector, their the, the requirements are basically categorized into four, uh, four uh, needs. One is the survival need, livelihood, food security, or food safety, or maybe these things. Second is the supports, supports in terms of uh, health, in terms of uh, ration, etc. And third is the transformational needs, education, skill development, etc. And fourth is the empowerment and enablement, access to the information and all these kind of things. Kind of things. So the most uh, common denominator of all these four categories of demands is the space. This report seems to, to me silent on this aspect, space. If you give them a space to work, they work very hard. They, they are uh, practically uh, much more honest. You cannot dub them as criminals, etc. as the police Generally, uh, so th this is one thing. Feedback. Pooja, yeah, please. 
I uh, I could be wrong, but uh, from uh, what I understand, the PLI scheme of the government of India is um, is a response to the demand side problem uh, of uh, uh, formal jobs not getting created uh, in large firms. Our discussion today has been primarily about small firms, but uh, a number of jobs created in in large firms. So I wanted uh, you know the panel to shed some light on how uh, if this is the correct policy response and uh, from from uh, what has happened, how successful this policy response has been. And if then after that there's time, I'll like clarification from Dr. Ghosh, uh, the, the informality denier on today's panel. Uh, and my question is that, you know, um, uh, if a daily wager is uh, using UPI, uh, does that mean this person is in, uh, in the formal economy? Uh, I am not, uh, I couldn't understand that link. So if you could clarify, please, thanks. 30 seconds each, I guess. <laughs> so first, uh, kindly respond to the question, whether you have interacted with the informal sector. That's a 10 second answer, I guess. Uh, look, to the, um, not too many questions to answer, but um, to the concern about, the question about uh, respond, responding or listening to the informal sector. Yes, I urge you to read the report and, um, it, it touches on these issues and we use a lot of primary survey data. Uh, the chart that Mauricio uh, discussed on Bangladesh, um, those were questions to, to small informal firms about what their issues are and what are their perceived benefits or not from formalizing. So um, um, it's, it's there in the, in, the, in the volume. And there were questions about a common definition of, of informality, uh, direct, indirect linkages, um, we can follow up later during during lunch. There's not enough time, but the the report touches on these issues too. Mr. Ghosh, please. Yeah, no, I think if uh, regarding the question that if somebody uh, is using an UPI uh, and whether he is, uh, uh, I think the consumption is getting formalized, so that is getting tracked. So that's the important point. So the point which I wanted to mention is that even then lacks of lacks of transaction is happening at the lower state of the society. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's very important that there is a data policy whereby this could be used for real time evidence based policy making. And the second point, very quickly, I would like to say is that now the government has an enough data on organized sector laborers. I think 28.4 crores is the amount of informal laborers who have uh, uh, re registered themselves on the Ishram portal. So if there is any scheme that could be rolled out, I think there should not be any problem because the data is very comprehensive as to my understanding in terms of states, in terms of sectors, in terms of profession, in terms of migra migrating patterns and other things. So there is scope to offer out formality in the informal contracts which we have in our society. Thank you, sir. Puja, if you don't mind, can we take this PLI question while we are having uh, the lunch? Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank the panelists as well as the authors. I think, ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for, for them. And thank you uh, for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.